Good afternoon and um, welcome to the lecture series of the Department of Political Science. Um, it's a bit of a strange thing here. Cindy is going to speak here and everybody's sitting over there. <laughs> but uh, your choice. <laughs> <laughs> So um, I would like to welcome you and um, introduce our guest today. Um, and um, well, Cindy Wittke is, I invited her um, as a holder of the Matthias Chair for German and European Studies, whose mission it is, among other things, to facilitate the academic exchange between Brazil and Germany. And this includes bringing German scholars to Sao Paulo or also to other places in Brazil. In Cindy's case, she'll also give speeches in Rio and Porto Alegre. Uh, so it's not only Sao Paulo, but Sao Paulo is, of course, the first uh, place she went to. And uh, she is a leader of the research group called Frozen and Unfrozen Conflicts at the Leibniz Institute for East and Southeast European Studies in Regensburg, a small pittoresque town in the south of Germany, not too far from Munich. And she, before that, she was uh, for three years a senior researcher and lecturer with the Department of Politics and Public Ad Administration of the University of Constance. Um, and she's also involved as uh, an affiliate fellow with um, the University of Edinburgh, specifically a project on peace agreements that is being conducted there. Um, Cindy earned her master's uh, degree in East European Studies at, at the Freie Universität Berlin. And uh, there she also concluded her PhD thesis um, at the Faculty of Law. So it's quite an interesting interdisciplinary profile that she represents in between social sciences, in particular political science, peace and conflict studies on the one hand, and international law, on the other hand, which is a topic which we already addressed in a workshop yesterday and this morning on interdisciplinarity between law and social sciences. Um, and uh, in particular, her research at the intersection of international law and social sciences addresses questions such as lawmaking in post-conflict settings, the negotiation and implementation of internationalized peace agreements involving state and non-state parties, and also processes of constitution making in conflict uh, and post-conflict contexts. Um, and she has published in several law journals, among other publications, including the Indiana Journal of Global Legal Studies, the Cambridge Journal of International and Comparative Law, and the Heidelberg Journal of International Law. Um, and another one that she'll probably mention because uh, her talk goes uh, draws on a recently published paper um, on, uh, in a journal on East Central and Eastern European law or something like that. Yeah, finally, I remember it. Um, and she also has a book uh, forthcoming on internationalized peace agreements, which is a revised version, version of her dissertation, and that's forthcoming with Cambridge University Press uh, in June this year. So, um, yeah, I'm very happy to have you here, and I think it's, it's also, you, you bring new interesting perspectives to the department, even though we have a number of people here that work at the intersection also of law and politics, and I think it's also impossible to think of many political science topics without any knowledge in law, so there are a number of connections. Um, and this topic of this talk today might seem a bit, might seem a bit exotic uh, for Brazilian, from a Brazilian perspective because there's not too much research being done on Eastern Europe and the post-Soviet space, except uh, maybe for a heightened interest this year because of the World Cup. <laughs> um, so, um, yeah, so it's going to be about Russia and its neighboring states and the political conflicts and problems of sovereignty and contested sovereignties that are currently at stake in that region. And with this, I would like to hand over to someone who knows more about that than I do. Um, and again, welcome to the Department of Political Science. Thank you so much for, for the kind uh, introduction. And 
hello again to a couple of people and faces that I already know from uh, Britta's seminar, uh, but also from, from this morning's presentation and uh, the workshop on interdisciplinary work. And of course, welcome uh, to, to all the others. So my topic today is related to my most recent research project um, that deals actually with clashing legal political discourses between Russia and what it conceptualizes as its antagonistic West since the Russo-Georgian War of 2008, and then in particular since uh, the annexation of Crimea and the starting of conflicts, separatist conflicts in East Ukraine. So this is basically work in progress. Um, as Britta mentioned, I just published a, a first paper that is relating um, to this, and of course this project is also related to the group that I'm currently leading and that deals with so-called frozen and unfrozen conflicts, and I will come a little bit later um, to the question of what those conflicts actually um, are. So I think this presentation might also be in a context where there's not so much uh, research done about Eastern Europe, uh, very timely because uh, we had just uh, presidential elections in, in Russia, uh, with an almost planned economy outcome of 67% uh, uh, of the population went to vote and of this uh, voters, 76.6% actually voted for Vladimir Putin um, being now in his fourth uh, term uh, of uh, presidency with one interruption during um, Medvedev's presidency, but he will be now president of Russia till 2000. 24. And of course, I think we will all have heard about a recent uh, conflict with the UK after uh, the so-called Skripal assassination, and that could perhaps affect the World Cup as the UK is currently threatening Russia to not send the English football team uh, to the World Cup. So that would maybe be in the benefit of the German team, so I don't know whether I'm partial or impartial with that outcome. So, but let's go to contested sovereignties in the post-Soviet um, space. So the five-day Russo-Georgian War of August 2008, the incorporation of Crimea into uh, Russian territory after a contested referendum and the declaration of independence in March 2014 and the ongoing and unresolved conflicts about the breakaway territory of Donetsk and Lugansk that very shortly also created a certain formation that they called Nova Russia, New Russia, basically taking reference to a historicized uh, territory or territorial entity, basically challenged the international community or made the international community of states witness to processes of contesting territories, borderlines within the post-Soviet space, the reimagination of citizenship and who is a citizen or who belongs to the Russian population or Russian-speaking population, and basically in the end of sovereignties in the post-Soviet space under the edges of the Russian Federation. So Russia's foreign policy conceptualizes all other 14 newly independent states that basically resulted of the dissolution of the Soviet Union as it's near abroad. So the near abroad or Bližnya Zabubiezhi uh, is a politicized geographic space where Russia has special interests and influence and that appears in effect to be a space of particular contested, conditional, and hierarchical sovereignties. So those 14 republics, with a certain exception of the Baltic states, which are very much in the, uh, close to the European Union and members of the European Union and of NATO, um, all the other um, states of um, the former Soviet Union are actually very strictly conceptualized as this special sphere of influence. Now, how does Western political science and law literature deal with those current contestations? So when we come to classical international law literature, that is mostly currently concerned with subsuming the acts of Russia 
under international law and actually identifying the violations of international law by Russia. When we draw our attention to international relations studies, we see a certain shift from previously constructivist approaches explaining Russia's foreign policy making and its shapes of an identity in the post-Soviet era, we are now seeing more and more a drift towards geopolitics and towards neo-realist schemes of explaining how Russia actually acts in its post-Soviet space, also challenging the European Union and what it conceptualizes as the West, which basically also mean, means with a focus on American hegemony. Now, when we take a perspective on comparative political science, we see that they are basically going from uh, considering Russia as a state in transition to democracy uh, towards accepting Russia as a form of semi-authoritarian regime and breaking with patterns of catch-up modernity and paradigms of democratization and uh, basically um, modernization. So one theme that is common to all those different strands of literature is actually a certain focus on propaganda and the role of propaganda um, in the contest contest currently ongoing contestations between Russia and the West. So this propaganda increasingly is referred to as lawfare in the context of law, but also as in information wars. And what it actually is, is how hybrid warfare or information warfare and lawfare become part of what is currently called hybrid warfare. And that is, after my opinion, also a certain phenomenon of rising populism uh, in international politics and international uh, relations. So the propaganda argument is actually also used to delegitimize Russia's argumentation when it comes to legitimizing its acts in the so-called post-Soviet space. So Russia's argumentation and attempts to legitimize its actions by references to international law are basically marked as propaganda by Western medias, by Western observers, uh, and by Western commentators. But it is also this, the, the other way around. It's the same the other way around. So Russia also marks their statements uh, as propaganda or actually marks Western perspectives on international law as certain formats of delegitimized perspectives, drawing on the Iraq invasion, the Kosovo invasion, and Kosovo's declaration of independence. So the Russian argumentation is that Western schemes of talking international law and acting with international law actually delegitimized themselves too. So we see actually how there are clashing argumentation and ar accusations building up that actually use facts or use the uh, subsumption of facts under international law for legitimizing actions and counteractions within the post-Soviet space, but increasingly also on a regional level and then on a global level. So basically I see that the vocabulary of international law is used to legitimize uh, each other's stand, but in particular it is used by Russia to legitimize its actions in the so-called near abroad, but also relating to another foreign policy concept that came up recently, which is the Russian world. So what is the Russian world, or Ruski Mir? So Ruski Mir actually means, uh, Mir has two meanings, peace and world. Uh, here it is translated as, as Russian world. And it's connect, connected to Russia's role as a continuator of the Soviet Union in the post-Soviet space, but it also conceptualizes a new idea of who is Russian. So it extends the idea of who is Russian to those who are speaking the Russian language. So it's not only that those are Russians who have a Russian passport and maybe live abroad, but also those who speak Russian and are framed to belong to the Russian population, 
And this has a certain effect, of course, how humanitarian intervention is framed and how Russia legitimizes the need to act on behalf of the Russian world and on behalf of those Russian-speaking minorities as it played out, for instance, in the case of Crimea and Russia's argumentation why it had to step in in Crimea or why the referendum in Crimea was justified and the secession of Crimea from the, uh, the Ukraine was actually um, in accordance with international law. So, Overall, Russia and its conceptualized antagonistic West take positions of, on public international legal front lines, both in the media, but also in international organizations, organs, as for instance, uh, in Security Council uh, meetings, um, as well as currently at the International Court of Justice, where we have a pending case of Ukraine versus the Russian Federation. So, in those different spaces of legal politics and international law, they invoke their counter-narratives concerning their understandings of the vocabulary of international law and politics, the regulation of international relations, and the foundation of contemporary world order. So basically, the aim of my project is, to a certain extent, to develop a better understanding what is at stake and what are the inner logics and functions of these current discursive clashes between Russia and the West. So under the surface of conflict constellations in Ukraine, these clashes have led to the formations of different understandings of the universal, regional and transnational meanings of territory, territorial integrity, civilization, space, and Russia's exercise of political and executive authority and force beyond its own borders. So I see this currently emerging and I try to make sense uh, of this through different um, perspectives. So after this short introduction, I would like to uh, follow the following steps in my presentation. So, in the next step, I will talk a little bit more about this conceptualization of the near abroad and the Russian world. Um, I will then move to an internal perspective, so how the internal perspective matters when we want to understand how law, uh, Russia uses the vocabulary of international law maybe differently and challenges the West. So I will take a perspective on the stability, legitimacy, and identity in post-Soviet authoritarian regimes at the example of Russia. And then I will proceed with exploring post-Soviet ideologies that I see connected with those foreign policy um, agendas, but also to a certain extent have an ex uh, effect of how international law is understood. And I will do this at the examples of Alexander Dugin's theory of neo-Eurasianism and the fourth political theory. Um, maybe I have to add a disclaimer to those here in the room who might have an idea who Alexander Dugin is um, and uh, what his theories are about. So this is more a comparison of certain discourses that are going on and how foreign policy concepts are formulated and how international legal understanding is expressed and how this compares to Dugin's theories than taking, for instance, Dugin as an influential person on the Kremlin. So there are certain promoted ideas in the, in the media that Dugin would have the ear of very high rock high-ranking people within the Kremlin, and that he would somehow whisper into the ear of Putin. So this is not my perspective. I rather see, want to see in which ideologies and in which theoretical frameworks those foreign policy concepts resonate within Russia, and maybe what kind of underlying understandings we can find to do more than assume that Russia is only instrumentalizing international law for its power purposes, but actually exploring 
uh, whether Russia really also advocates a different understanding of international law, seeking coherence in that understanding and probably staying within that understanding and continuing to act within that understanding on the regional and on the international level. And this will basically be in the center of the fifth point of my presentation on the many meanings of the vocabulary of international law and those clashes between uh, Western understandings and Russian approaches to international law before I then come to a summary and an outlook. So let me come to the near abroad and the Russian world. Mm. So I took the picture of a matryoshka, which is uh, the Russian nested doll, uh, because the dissolution of the Soviet Union is quite often compared with the matryoshka effect. So you take the, the open use of the Soviet Union, and all of a sudden you have a lot of smaller entities. And those smaller entities actually dissolve into even smaller entities that are claiming their sovereignty from uh, their parent state. So the Russian nested doll is taken as an image of the so-called Matryoshka effect that started with the dissolution of the Soviet Union, leading to 14 independent new 15 independent new states, but most of those states also face challenge concerning their territorial integrity from even smaller entities that had a certain status within the context of the ethno-federal logic how the Soviet Union functioned. So, but the main matryoshkas that resulted from uh, the dissolution of the Soviet Union are basically the 14 independent, other independent uh, republics. So this is an overview of, of the map of how this uh, near abroad stretches actually from Belarus that borders uh, Poland. So basically how this near abroad is actually in the borderline of the European Union. And then I have another map that actually shows those frozen and unfrozen conflicts. So here we have singled out uh, on the map the so-called frozen and what we also call in, my, in our group the unfrozen conflicts. So there are territorial conflicts, for instance, in the Republic of Georgia that led to the Russo-Georgian War in 2008. There is Nagorno-Karabakh between Armenia and Azerbaijan. There is Transnistria, which is the sandwich between Ukraine and Moldova, uh, which uh, led to a conflict at the beginning of the 1990s. And then we also have the most recent conflicts, which is Crimea, um, and the annexation of Crimea, and then on the, on the number one and number two are actually Donetsk and Lugansk, the recent breakaway territories or separatist conflicts on the territory of Ukraine. Now, we could debate now whether Crimea and uh, those two separatist conflicts on the territory of Ukraine actually still belong to this Matryoshka effect of the dissolution of the Soviet Union and whether they belong to the logic of the so-called frozen conflicts that were left in the post-Soviet space. Because those frozen conflicts actually had a peak in the 1990s of violent conflict and then were frozen at a certain line, actually in their inner logic building up um, own state ins uh, institutions and uh, in the outer logic being still non-recognized de facto territories in the parent states of Georgia, Moldova, and Azerbaijan. So this is an overview of the map, what we are actually talking about uh, when we see the so-called near abroad. So with the collapse of the Soviet Union, one question was how the post-Soviet geopolitical space would be reshaped and reinterpreted, and who would do this? A core question was and continues to be, what are Russia's present and future roles in that process? So the near abroad and the Ruski Mir, or the Russian world, are so to say answers of 
Russian identity formation within that post-Soviet space, claiming a certain special role within this context, and nowadays also resonating with the idea of neo-Eurasianism. So this is uh, basically a clear antagonism to what is a multipolar world, or it is actually shaping ideas of a multipolar world as an antagonism to, um, for instance, a hegemonic world that is under the leadership of the United Nations, um, the, the USA. So the conceptualization is basically Rus seeing Russia as the heartland of this post-Soviet space. So the relevance of an analytical focus on the concept of the near abroad and Ruski Mir is evident in the examples of those post-Soviet de facto regimes like Abkhazia, South Ossetia and Transnistria that have built up quasi-state institutions and are functioning based on quasi-constitutions. Russia plays a particular role in all these and other post-Soviet frozen conflicts uh, and de facto state entities. On the one hand, there is no solution of the status conflicts without Russia's involvement. Um, and on the other hand, um, Russia in a way furthers their status or their existence. So with the recognition, for instance, of Abkhazia and South Ossetia, Russia in a way becomes a kin state of those states. It supports their existence and them challenging the existence or the integrity of the parent state. So taking together, the forging developments appear to be shaped by a specific regional foreign policy strategy on the part of the Russian state that uses international legal vocabulary and um, a reconceptualization of sovereignty to guarantee dominance in the post-Soviet space. And this is basically in particular visible in the Russo-Georgian War of 2008, but then in the recent challenge of Ukrainian territorial integrity that started actually with um, the annexation of Crimea and then later with the conflicts in Donetsk and Lugansk. Mm. So the contestation of sovereignty and um, the dominance of or seeking for dominance in the post-Soviet space is, I think, closely related to Russian domestic politics. So basically, the question is uh, how to build up a strong Russian regime and how to keep up the current uh, authoritarian structures within Russia and finding an inter inner logic for creating stability, legitimacy, um, and a certain identity of this post-Soviet authoritarian regime. So despite an initial optimism um, that came about with the dissolution of the Soviet Union and the probability of a starting democratization process, the collapse of the Soviet Union has actually led to a string of what is called post-Soviet authoritarian regimes. Modernization and democratization processes uh, projects have actually not managed to fully capture the complexities of transformation processes or in particular to explain the stability and relative legitimacy of those post-Soviet authoritarian regimes. So current debates in the literature are increasingly seeking to distance from the pre preliminary referential nature of the Western model of modernization and democratization as a yardstick for the transformation of those countries. The challenge is to search for actually for new paradigms that explain hybrid and asymmetric power relations and that help to approach uh, approaching questions like what makes the Russian regime legitimate. And I would actually like to quote uh, Tim Beichelt who is uh, a German researcher um, that has a high profile in investigating 
um, the political system of post-Soviet um, states and transformation theories. In the, uh, the post-Soviet space, normative standards of the liberal democracy theory are annulled through authoritarian practices and anti-emancipatory ideas without the majority of the populations being bothered by these developments. This does not imply, however, that observers, e.e. Western politicians, journalists or scholars, have to give up their ideals of democracy. Yet, for understanding current developments in Eastern Europe, it seems essential to not a priori declare the empirical conditions and normative reasoning of recognition of rule and authority in the post-Soviet space as inappropriate. So in a way, that plays into what I'm attempting to do in my research. So the aim, for instance, of my research is not either to assess whether Russia's conduct in the post-Soviet space is according, in accordance with international law. It is more about understanding how this understanding, Russian understanding and Russian approach to international law within that field and within that region actually works without actually evaluating it according to what I understand international law to be and what I consider right or wrong in accordance with international law. So the general assumption that is related to this quote is that those in power will seek to secure some general consent concerning the legitimacy of their power, at least from the most important actors and groups amongst their subordinates. So what is legitimate power and how is legitimate power maybe also in an authoritarian regime exercised? So according to Beetham, power can be considered legitimate insofar as it is exercised in the line with established rules. These rules can be justified by reference to beliefs shared by both dominance and subordinates and that there is evidence of the subordinate's consent to the particular power relation. So, what counts as consent is culturally specific um, and must be determined uh, according to given conventions in a society, um, and no society can set to, be ha to have uh, uniform beliefs, for instance. In the end, both legitimacy or illegitimacy can materialize in each of those different dimensions. That is, in each of these dimensions, legitimacy can be realized or can be also not realized. In the end, Beetham finds that the social scientist, in concluding that a given power relationship is legitimate, are making a judgment. So they are not delivering an objective report about legitimacy, but legitimacy is always also making a judgment. Power, meanwhile, is created through social interaction, highlighting the relevance of social psychology, that is, social and psychological processes of self-categorization and collective identification. As a theoretical and analytical framework, social psych psychology is gaining attention an authoritarianism research concerned with the relationship between identity and power. The formation of collective identity is not primarily rooted in the satisfaction of needs and interest, but in the responsive construct of meanings, namely the meaning of the self in the social context and the interaction between self and collective identity. Now, breaking this down to um, the near abroad and the, in the post-Soviet context, it is basically the key question how identity is created in post-Soviet sta um, states, in the internal level, but also in the external uh, relations of post-Soviet states with each other, but also with the world. And in particular here, Russian self -creation, Russia's self-creation of identity with foreign policy concepts also of near abroad and the Russian world that actually somehow seem to lead to restitution of the greatness of the Soviet Union. And here we could, for instance, refer 
to the famous quote of, of Vladimir Putin, who basically called um, the dissolution of the Soviet Union as one of the biggest catastrophes of the 20th century. So relating this now to mechanisms of propaganda, it was the head of the famous Levada Center in Moscow that is an independent survey center that does current, constantly surveys in Russia about political identity, about political opinion, and that enjoys a certain independence and is not very much in line with the regime. The head of the Levada Center actually argues that Russian domestic and international politics could still be accepted in the absence of propaganda by the population. So he basically argues, argues that propaganda alone cannot really create legitimacy and cannot make the population agree with the politics of the state. What he actually observes is that the propaganda resonates with certain forms of identity formation, which is an emphasis on creating a strong state, an emphasis on the loss of a superpower with the dissolution of the Soviet Union, and that political events are defined as emergent and exceptional, usually, in order um, to influence the collective opinion by pointing to common threats of Russia or for Russia by um, the international community or by internal conflict. Another element that adds to this um, form of identification is an increasingly explicit break with the West. So an increasing form of anti-modernism, traditionalism, and a break with the modernization paradigm. And that very well resonates with uh, neo-Eurasianism and certain theories that are currently promoted. So which brings me to the next point of exploring post-Soviet um, ideologies. Mm. So I see the foreign concept of the near abroad that already existed um, since the 1990s, and the more recent uh, project of the Russian world, very closely related to certain theories that are currently discussed uh, within Russian society and within Russian academia. And neo-Eurasianism and this fourth political theory are just one example of the many, uh, but probably um, also the most well-known and well-debated currently uh, in, in the West. So at the core of, uh, of this debate is the neo-Eurasianism of Alexander Dugin, a former professor of sociology at the Moscow State University, who's said to have, as I already said, uh, the ear of high-ranking members of the Duma. So what is neo-Eurasianism? So neo-Eurasianism, like pan-Slavism and other theories, actually originated in immigre uh, Russian circles after the revolution, but now are revitalized in a new form, in a new form uh, of populism and uh, additionally eclecticism. According to neo-Eurasianist ideas, legitimacy and identity are no longer based on a common project of modernization but on a radical perception of civilizational differences and traditions. Responsiveness is, uh, is generated through appeals to the long durée of common traditionalist culture, civilizational ideas, and religious beliefs. Neo-Eurasianism primarily reflects various post-Soviet attempts to elaborate Eurasianist idea um, in a comprehensive philosophical and political doctrine. So Dugin's view from 2000 till around 2008 was that Europe and Russia were not antithetical to each other, but instead related. Neo-Eurasianist and broader civilizational concepts actually offer uh, Russia an ideolo ideological framework 
for demonstrating that its foreign policy agenda and current contract draw on this long durée of Russian tradition and that Russian state-less Eurasian uh, integration initiatives rest on a cultural legitimacy rooted in cultural and civilizational differences between Russia and the West as well as in Russia's special historical and cultural role in the Eurasian space. Neo-Eurasianism and Dugin's fourth political theory revived geopolitics as a phenotype of an ideological, cultural, and civilizational framework, leading to the redefinition of the area and geographies of the post-Soviet space, while also actively furthering the delegitimization of an antagonistic West. References to common civilizational and cultural narratives enables Russian state to challenge universalist Western approaches, like is also including universalist approaches to international law and to state conduct, and emphasize that liberal democracies constitute a hegemonic geopolitical, geoeconomic, and geocultural project emanating from the West in general and the United States in particular. Furthermore, in his book, The Fourth Political Theory, Dugan declares fascism and communism to have failed. But he also declares the end of the end of history. So he basically also declares the end of the liberal model. The Fourth Political Theory act advocates for an act of conservative, for conservatism that is anti-rational and anti-democratic, in which elites and governance are legitimized through a form of common spirituality. The fourth political theory also draws on theories reaching from Samuel Huntington's Clash of Civilizations, Carl Schmitt's idea of nomos, uh, Mackinder's heartland, or Haushofer's biologistic concept of Lebensraum. So that actually shows how eclectic um, those concepts and those theories are, and that they probably are beyond um, logic and reasoning as we know it or see it from, from theories that we know, but more and more go into a certain form of promulgated anti-modernism, um, traditionalism, and challenging uh, the belonging to the West and challenging the West by reconceptualizing and developing new, new ideas of territory, space, and citizenship. So how does this, in a way, relate to the different understandings promoted currently concerning international law? So I try to draw a line from Russian foreign policy concepts like the near abroad and Ruski Mir um, to internal perspectives on how stability and legitimacy is built up in that post-Soviet authoritarian regime where it resonates maybe in popular theories and, theor and, and theoretical frameworks. And I'm now going taking the birds perspectives on how legal clashes currently evolve between Russia and the West that resonate with all those different aspects of the current context of regional as well as um, global politics. So the Russian government currently postulates official positions in international law and politics are perceived as challenges to and for the alleged universal European and Western approaches to sovereignty, territorial integrity, non-intervention, and self-determination. So on the official international level, Russia maintains a hyper-formalist positivist approach to international law when pointing to the alleged hypocrisies of the West's violation of sovereignty and territorial integrity of Serbia, Iraq, or Libya. However, the arguments raised by Russia are seen as a form of international legal rhetoric that Russia abuses or uses to justify its ambition to further consolidate its dominant role and position in the post-Soviet near abroad or in 
that heartland that are, is, for instance, conceptualized by Dugin. Nevertheless, uh, as one scholar recently pointed out, unlike other, another geopolitical crisis of our time, the attempts of ISIS to redraw the map in the Middle East, the situation in Ukraine is not a conflict over the existence of international legal order, but rather one of the meaning of its foundational building blocks. The internal and external self-determination of peoples, territorial integrity, and the sovereign equality of independent state. Thus, what is at risk with, con with concepts like near abroad, Ruski Mir, and the current new forming of an identity that is um, anti-modern um, and anti-American uh, and anti-European is not the existence, but probably the coherence and stability of international law and politics, and in particular the usage of international legal vocabulary of dispute settlements and international law's functions of offering institutions for the resolution of disputes. So what we are facing is increasingly a multiglossic international law, so in which international law is then spoken differently in different spaces. So the relevant discussions are usually torn between two vectors. The established usage of the language of international law, how it is framed by the idea of a European or Western international law. So if we accept that international law and the liberal world order are European and Western post-World um, War II project, um, they are shaped by this usage of uh, the language of international law as a universal language, but are threatened then and challenged by the language of hybrid warfare and lawfare. Hybrid warfare in the post-Soviet space and the contestation of borders and the meanings of sovereignty pose a challenge not only for doctrinal international lawyers, but also for those lawyers whose ambition is to go beyond those doctrinal debates when addressing conflict constellations in Ukraine and in the post-Soviet space and actually asking for the meanings and the relevance of international law and what is at stake currently in those clashing legal discourses for international law and the usage of international law. Thus, they also aim to explore how international lawyers should respond to the challenges posed by the blurring of the meanings of fundam fundamental legal categories in the course of the Ukraine crisis. So I fully accept those different ambitions of international legal discourses in reflecting how Russia uses the language of international law against the background of foreign policy concepts like near abroad or the Russian world. Um, but I would like to, to turn my focus to the different usage of the vocabulary of international law and the creating of clashing international legal discourses by Russia and the West. Um, and I think this perspective will presumably enable an insight if, into the different understandings um, of the languages of international law by starting with the question of what is actually the hegemony that is created um, in international law. So how can the term hegemony be applied to processes of making claims concerning using the vocabulary of international law? Marty Koskiniemi uses uh, a hegemonic perspective as a descriptive technique whereby something particular, an interest or a preference, is presented as something universal. So a certain political uh, preference is presented as a universal claim following the logic of that international law is a universal language. So there are battles about universality and there was also battles about the hegemonic understanding and practices of international law and its principles. According to Koskinemi, international law is a process of articulating political preferences into legal claims which cannot be detached from political contestation or from the condition in which they were made. So, seen as a hegemonic te technique in which different approaches to and contestations of international legal discourses are seen as hegemonic discourses 
is actually the perspective that Koskiniemi's uh, approach promulgates. Thus, hegemonic contestation, according to Koskiniemi, are processes in which international actors routinely challenge each other by invoking <laughs> legal rules and principles on which they project meanings that they will support their own preferences and counteract those of their opponents. But unlike Koskiniemi, I assume that those constructions of these different meanings do not always have a certain end goal. So they don't necessarily follow a certain rationality. They can also change and be cons uh, subject to fluctuation. So it's not that those rationalities or those clashing discourses are following different patterns of reasoning or seeking a certain objective. Um, so I think Russia's official argumentation regarding territorial conflicts in Ukraine is a good example of how Russia, though hardly neglecting, for instance, sovereignty as a foundational concept of international order, nonetheless challenges the legal and political meanings of the concept of sovereignty in its near abroad by establishing spatial and transboundary differences and hierarchies of sovereignty. Sovereignty, which has never gone as an uncontested uh, concept, is a, a constant presence in political and legal debates and language, but becomes changeable, for instance, through radical traditional ideas like neo-Eurasianism. The legal and political dimension of the concept of the sovereignty in the post-Soviet space can be contextualized in the foreign policy concept of the near abroad and the Russian world, and the theoretical and ideological framework of neo-Eurasianism and the fourth political theory. Interestingly enough, Russia's argumentation concern, concerning its own domestic and international sovereignty and conditional sovereignty in its near abroad um, is not syn synchronic, but tied to civilizational ideas of, for instance, heartland and Großraum. This is asynchronic, and um, differentiation also affects Russian discourses on territorial te on territoriality of political rule and the use of force. Thus, in current clashes between Russian and Western legal discourses, um, they have led to changing spatial understanding of sovereignty, and then and not actually to the neglect of sovereignty. So we see new spaces drawn in which, for instance, international law and international politics are applied differently. All the basic principles are interpreted and implemented differently. So in the end, uh, I would follow uh, Laurie Malkso, who claims that there was hardly ever a genuine and deep and, and deep going agreement between Moscow and the West regarding under, underlying values and principles of the post war World War II international law, legal order and that this is actually continuing um, in particular since the Russo Georgian War of two thousand and eight and since the annexation of Crimea in two thousand and fourteen and the conflicts in Eastern um, Ukraine. So I think that all these different strands of uh, foreign policy concepts, internal perspectives, and then the effect on how Russia understands international law and uses international law or the politics of international law in international poli politics basically ask for continuous interdisciplinary conversation um, about how law and politics are framed in the post-Soviet space and how this might also affect uh, Russia's future conduct on the international level um, as, for instance, what we can currently see at the example of Syria. But nonetheless, like speaking in a context of, of European research on, on in Eastern Europe, uh, we face the challenge of a lack of area expertise. 
So in the, last, in the past 25 years, um, area studies and focus on Russia or also especially Ukraine has been neglected. Um, there is a certain lack of research and foundational research about Eastern Europe that is just currently um, taking up again um, and that needs um, more voices and more inv investigations um, in, in the future and which is actually um, the current challenge of, um, for instance, uh, my group but also other research institutions that are um, created in, in Germany. Um, so these are first attempts to actually make sense of taking a different perspective of Russia's current conduct on the regional and international um, level. It's a research very much at, at its beginnings um, that nevertheless tries to move away from geopolitical perspectives or neorealist perspectives and tries to develop a new form of understanding of the reframing of politics and law in a post-Soviet space that is a challenge for Europe um, and that is also a challenge uh, on the global scale um, when we, for instance, consider processes of decision-making and debates in the Security Council. So and with these last words, uh, I thank you for your attention at this uh, rather late hour for, for an academic uh, context and it was also a very long day uh, for me with already the third presentation today. Um, so I'm looking nevertheless forward to uh, the discussion and your questions um, and please feel also free to ask questions for clarifications if some of the concepts I refer to or some of the literature I refer to um, might be unknown uh, to you or um, when they are not uh, clear or when they did not come across clear for you. Thank you very much.